Amen. Amen. We turn your Bible to the first Thessalonians chapter four. Verse number three. We go to Acts chapter nineteen. We're going to read verse number one there. For this is the will of God. For this is the will of God. Even your sanctification. Even your sanctification. That ye abstain, that she should abstain from fornication. That she should abstain from fornication. But every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Everyone would know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Tonight we want to deal with the subject of sanctification, the what, the why, the how. Oh my God. Sanctification, the what, the why, and the how. Of all the messages of the church, I'm not sure that there's a more serious message or important message than the message of sanctification. It's very, very important to understand this message, not just from a theory perspective, but actually from an experiential perspective. More people lose out with God because of a lack of going on to sanctification than just about anything else. More people are up and down in their experience because of a lack of going on to sanctification than just about anything else. And we're going to break this down by scripture. Why is it that some people seem to be up and down, in and out, victory for some time, then no victory from some time. It, many times you can trace it right back to a lack of a definite sanctified experience. More people never fulfill the true, full spiritual potential. Their true, full spiritual potential because of a lack of sanctification than anything else. It's not because they didn't make room for me in the church, they wouldn't let me sing, they wouldn't let me uh, teach my class, or uh, 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 they didn't like me, or, or certain families or certain people can do. But uh, many times the issue that many people don't fulfill because I'm going to tell you, if a person goes on and truly gets fully sanctified the power of God, people will be the door down to your house to get to you. You don't have to have a title. You don't have to have a position. The gift will make room for you. God will work a way. It may not be anything up behind the pulpit. It might be on the street corner. It might be on your job. It might be some study. But God will use you. God does not need to go through people or go through a system, go through a congregational structure, those things are good. But if you go on to truly die out to self, die out to the world, sell all the way out for God, be filled with the Spirit, let Him purge you of that carnal nature, you have but one consuming desire, that's to be used of God. You're giving yourself to God, not for some glory, personal sake, but to nothing more but to draw close to God and to labor for Him. God will make a way out of no way for your gifts to be used, for you to be a blessing, for God to use you in a significant way. My God, my God. More marriages in the church have deep problems of getting along, respecting each other, and working together as one unit okay. because of a lack of sanctification more than anything else. It's not we were raised different, we come from different backgrounds, or he likes to, uh, the oatmeal hot, I like it warm, he likes the temperature that hot, all those things are wonderful and all those things. He's a, a, a spendthrift, I like to spend money, he's so stingy, he don't uh, communicate well, he always uh, wants to, uh, the, she don't cook. Those are good things, legitimate things that can 
hinder a marriage, but I'm telling you, and I'm going to show you through God's word tonight, many times marriages, even in the church of God, are not on one accord respecting each other, uh, uh, together really working with each other, because either one or both are not sanctified. That's right. More congregations have inner congregational problems because of a lack of sanctification among the people than anything else. Let me say that again. More congregations have a problem. Yes, you're right. This person should be helping out more, but there's a way that you can go about it. If you end up having carnality, Festering throughout the congregation. The ushers can't get along with the trustees. Trustees can't get along with the cooks. Cooks can't get got something to say every time the pastor says this. Ministers, this, that. I'm going to tell you if there's a lack of a definite sanctified, I'm going to show you through God's word. Many, listen, when you're sanctified, you never get out the spirit. That's right. It don't matter, my God, what they did to you. You don't go back and handle it in God. It's never right for you to get out the spirit. It's never right for you to give somebody a part of your mind. It's never right for you to handle to anything other than a godly way. Many times in a congregation, you have people that don't like each other, can't get along with each other, can't have a conversation with each other, walk past each other for years, generational issues. They would hand down to other little children and so on and so forth. Why? Because of a lack of sanctification. We're going to break this down tonight with the help of God to understand this. These problems are often signified significantly more complicated when people are able to ascend to leadership roles within the congregation without possessing the full work of sanctification. I said in general, congregations have problems with the lack of sanctification, but it's significantly worse. You get somebody in position because you like them. Or because uh, they're really good at this. I don't care what you're really good at. That's not going to make you a good in the church of God. That's your natural ability or natural talent. But the Bible says, seek ye out seven men full of the Holy Ghost. That's right. And wisdom. My Why? Because this is not God. just an organization. This is an organism. This is God's church. Oh, and you get people in positions. Yes, sir. That still have carnality on board. Uh, uh, they'll be using grudges to get back at people. That's why the Bible said, not a striker. That's right. Man, you must want to get a... a Sanctified minister of everything. If you did me wrong or you said this, every message I got is for you. Every single I'm gonna find one for you. I'm gonna get you. Let them teach them Sunday school, whatever else it may be. If an individual can ascend to lead churches, let me say this: more factions are developed in congregations, and more divisions develop in fellowships because of a lack of sanctification than anything else. Right. Factions in the congregation, in the we're gonna break all this down tonight by the help of God. You end up with this group and this group over here. What group are you with? This that the other. You really get the feel of the Holy Ghost. You ain't with no group. I ain't, I ain't with nobody. You notice I'm not I'm not no clicky with nobody. I'm not getting up under nobody's spirit. You can mess around. You're gonna see this in the word of God and get carnal and have I like this, brother. I like this. Whoa, 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 what in the word is all about God? Where did, where, 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 where did this humanity come in at? We're gonna get to that in a moment. More standards and doctrines are not adhered to, and more worldliness and compromise is present among congregations because of a lack of sanctification than anything else. People will develop a mindset that I will do what I want to do, although the Word of God and the Gospel says this, that, and the other. There are more clouds over people's experiences because of a lack of sanctification than anything else. That's Preventing right, joy, questioning how do I deal with this? Oh. I feel this way. I had this difference with this person. I left there feeling heavy, feeling down because I had to tell them I was going to defend myself, this, that, and the other. Now the cloud is over and they wonder, do I see myself? Can I really rejoice in the service? They're in there. They're going to say something. They, uh, 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 oh, I, I didn't really do what I was supposed to do at school. I was, I was doing these things. Other young people saw me doing it, so I'm up and I'm, I'm, I'm rejoicing. Then they want to be a part so they still get up but when they get up they're really giving a devil moan and not a testimony they'll say things like it's so hard it's so difficult pray for me saints I'm struggling this and that many times it's because the Holy Ghost my God is not fully on board and there's still some self there that want to do what it want to do yes you want to be saved but you want to get kind of close to this boy you want to be saved you want fire in your soul but you really my God I still want to dibble and dabble in some websites and some social stuff that you really should
shouldn't be doing. So now you got this cloud over you because you got this boy inboxing you and texting you at midnight, checking on you, asking what you're doing. And you just say, yeah, now you come to church, you really want to go forth. You really want to be saved, but you're struggling with this. But if you got going on to get sanctified and burned up that carnal nature and said, Lord, I want to do your will more than my will. Lord, I want you to do what you want to do. It's not a struggle. People say it's so hard. It's not hard being saved when you're going to get truly sanctified. Amen. The Amen. Bible said the way of the transgressor is hard, but my yoke is easy. Amen. Why is his yoke easy? Because you submitted yourself Amen. to his Amen. yoke. Amen. Leave me how you want to leave me. Amen. I'm not fighting you. My yoke is in your hand. You leave me, do what you want. And when I got saved, you dealt with sin. When I got sanctified, you dealt with my yoke. My yoke was given to you, and your yoke is easy. Amen. 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 There are more congregations with multiple standards among the members of the congregation because of a lack of sanctification than anything else. They develop a mind. He teaches his own. I know the word of God says this. I know the pastors. I know the ministry preaches again. I know they said, but I'm wearing what I want to wear. So now you wonder, do we wear that or do we not wear it? Do we go here or do we not go here? You know the word, what, the, what a lack of sanctification will do will cause you, if you don't see it in black and white, as sin, and you know the gospel standard, as hard as it is to get an acceptable standard, and this lukewarm lay out of sin age, the ministry labor before God fasting and praying to preach the full gospel, but till you can go and do what you want to do, as bad as it is compromised all over the world, a very few places you can truly go where the whole word of God can be preached with divine inspiration, with God confirming it with signs and wonders and you've been blessed to be in a fruitful hill and you can't my God submit your own little will because you want to wear what you want to wear do what you want to do go where you want to go and just do you you're selfish you're selfish you don't care we're all to be a light to the world collectively we are the body we are the cloud the ministry preaches the gospel we embrace it we live it we're the cloud the living witness amen but because of the lack of sanctification, you have to have congregation do this, other half don't do it. Half oh congregation don't watch ungodly movies and all this other stuff. The other half, do what they do. Half congregation don't listen to worldly music, ungodly stuff. Oh just worldly music come out. How in the world you gonna be a follower of Christ listening to the? I don't care if the lyrics. It's a spirit with that stuff. And if you got the Holy Ghost, your spirit don't agree with that spirit. Matter of fact, let me take it a step further. You get the real old fashioned Holy Ghost down inside you, it's about half, maybe 40% or 50% of gospel music that your spirit don't even agree with their right. tongue. Right. And this, that, and the other, my God. Let alone some ungodly, worldly music. So you end up with multiple standards, and you have to select what people in the congregation that the pastor can use to truly be counselors. Because even though they've been saved for 20 years, there's things in their life, in their home, in their involvement that is not the best example. And the person, the Holy Ghost, has dealt with them many times. You are not a perfect example if you're involved in this. The Word of God does this, says this. They should be able to come to you with anything. The Bible speaks about the whole kind. We should live it all the way out. It should be no area of our life as a saint. Not a minister, my God, but a saint of God. That, my God, we cannot be an example. Go home with me. Go to work with me. Look at my finances. Look at my phone. Look at my musical selection. Look at my conversation. Look whatever. Why? Because the Bible says, ye are the light of the world. Sit on a hill. If my marriage, you should be able to come home with me. Talk to my wife. Ask her, do I dog? Her out. Do I talk to her? Do I not respect her highly? Do I not uh, uh, pray with the children every day? Do I not? I gotta be an example. I can't have weak areas, strong areas, things that abide by the standards, and some areas I don't. When I go on vacation, I gotta be fully an example along every single line. But when a person don't go on to get fully sanctified, you have them doing stuff to their hair they shouldn't be doing, going places they shouldn't be going. It's a good clip and loop. I have and all this other food questionable stuff that is nothing more than fleshy attraction to the flesh. The Bible said I beautify the meat with salvation. You get fully sanctified. They're not going to keep begging you and asking you and pointing and critiquing. You get all that tight stuff and you say, I don't want to own to be modest, my God. So you end up with multiple standards in one congregation because of a lack going on. There's a greater threat to a congregation operating 
There is no greater threat to a congregation operating with true, true divine inspiration. Man, you get some uh, congregation full of sanctified young people, my God. Oh, prayer me, praise God. I mean, on fire for God. And see, we're going to break this out. It's more practical than we think. I mean, see, you hear them talk about their future. You just see God all in it. They just talk about the will of God with my life. I mean, that's convicting. They not even talk about worldly. See, we think of worldliness like somebody going to say, you get to. Worldliness is just ambition. The world's ambition. That's your desire? You thinking of the best job I can get, the best money, the best degree, the best. No, 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 no. Yes, I want to take care of my family. Okay. But how can I please God? When you start talking like that, that brings conviction into a room. Even want to know who am I going to marry? I just want somebody that, 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 that's inspirational. We can have a function where God can bless my life. They can be, here you try to find the little cutest thing you can find, this, that, and the other, so on and so forth. No real depth of spirituality there. You're attracted to the flesh as it is, my God. But when you truly are sanctified, it even uh, uh, affects who you uh, uh, consider in life. You begin to think about spiritual things. You begin to think about ways in which you can glorify God. You get a promotion on your job. You get two job offers. You're literally be sitting there in the worldly sense. Okay, this one got this benefit. This one got this much money. This one got this. You get sanctified. You'll be sitting them both down. And you'll be looking literally, which one could I glorify God with? Which one could I have more time with the saints, my God? Which one will be less stressful, my God? Yeah. You're dealing with two majors. I want to be this and I want to be this. But you know what? This one right here will consume so much. It's not uh, attributable to my gifts. So it's going to take me so much to get this. And I'm going to have to spend so much time with it. I don't want to uh, affect. This won't be simpler. I can get a job even though. I mean, you think it's spirit. It's power in that. There's authority in that. There's something like that. God commands with that. Okay. There's no greater threat to a congregation operating with true divine inspiration, power, and consistent productivity. My Lord, gifts and callings that a congregation void of the active, clear message of sanctification and void of the inspiration and power to consistently produce the experience in new converts. Let me say that again. There is no greater threat to a congregation operating with true divine inspiration, power, and consistent productivity than a congregation void of an active, clear message of sanctification and void of the inspiration and power to produce it consistently in its new converts. All right. We're going to look into this. A little bit of time that we have remaining. Sanctification. The what? The why? And the how? What is it? Why do we need it? And how do we get it? Let's go over. Well, let me read these definitions. And I'm going to use two scriptures to support. There's two basic meanings of what is sanctification. Sanctification, by definition, we will read several. To set apart for a particular use. And the second piece is to make holy or sacred. So there are basically two meanings of what is sanctification. It means to set apart for particular use and be to make holy or sacred. Another definition said to sanctify someone or something is to set that person or thing apart for the use intended by its or their design. The meaning of biblical sanctification is to be set apart for God's work for him to use as our desire, as he see fits. <laughs> sanctification is a work of God, performed by God. It is an intricate part of our salvation yeah. and our complete connection with Christ. So we said the two parts, some call it the second work of grace, some call it the crucif crucifixion of the old man, so on and so forth. But there's two basic tenets. One is to set apart for particular use. Acts 30, I'm sorry, Exodus 30, 26. Let's look at that first one. It's set apart for particular use. Acts, I'm sorry, Exodus 30, 26. Okay. 
And thou shalt anoint the, ta anoint the tabernacle mm -hmm. and the congregation therewith. Thou shalt anoint the tabernacle and the congregation therewith. Come on. And the ark of the testimony. Come on. And the table and all his vessels. Uh -huh. And the candlestick and his vessels. Uh -huh. And the altar of incense. My Lord. And the altar of burnt offering, yes. and all his vessels, uh -huh. and the labor at his foot. Come on. And thou shalt sanctify them, uh -huh. that they be, that they may be most holy. Uh -huh. Whatsoever touches them shall be holy. Okay. So here they sanctify them. Verse thirty said, Thou shalt anoint Aaron and sons and consecrate them. So here they anointed all these pieces of the tabernacle, the the lamp with the uh uh. uh Right here, with seven candles. The, over there, the table of showbread. All these things, even the lava before you went in. They anointed every single piece of all these things within it. And that meant that they set it apart. Yeah. Only to be used for the business of the tabernacle. Amen. Right, brother. So now, if, 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 if one of the Israelites was at home and they candle went out in their house and they were trying to make some bread or something, they couldn't run inside the tabernacle, grab one of those lamps, and come on back. And that set apart just for that. So you, can't, you can't use it for no. If the bread was in there, you couldn't say, I'm real, real hungry. I'm going. No, 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 no. No, no, no that, that's annoying. That's set apart just for that. So here he says, in the same type, remember in the Old Testament, the type. The same type that these articles were set apart just for that, when a person comes and gets saved, they're forgiven. And we're going to break this down. But when they go on to an altar and God deals with them, they go on and get sanctified. They actually say, Lord, I'm setting my life apart. Whatever you want to do with me, my heart says amen. I'm not my own. I'm not my own God. I, if you want me to go to Africa to be an evangelist, I'll go to Africa and be an evangelist. If you want me to God, it, I don't, I don't, it, it, and sometimes it's a song that said, I saw the death. I had to die. A death in which my soul, I always wanted to be this, and I wanted to be this, and I want, Lord, it don't even matter. It don't even matter. Whatever you want to do, I'm putting it all on the altar. But what about this? You know, you all, it ain't even sinful. You all, it, Lord, it don't even matter. It's only I'm putting it on, I'm putting my whole self, I'm putting all that I am and hope to be. I commit, dear Lord. That's why a lot of people lack a certain amount of power. There's a power you get. There's a, an authority you get. When you give up all, and you know, and God knows when you've done it. You've given up all you hope to be. All your ambitions of the world, of, 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 of worldly wealth and esteem and this and the other. You've actually given it up to God, do what you want to do. It don't even matter, God. Just fill me with your power. Lord, burn. See, and we call it the carnal nature, and we'll get to that, but really it's a selfish. You, you, it, it, you dealt with sin when you got saved. You can't get saved and still be in sin. In order to get saved, you get all things that are sinful. You say, Lord, I want to be saved. Forgive me for all my sins. All the things that I'm doing that are sinful, dear God, I'm asking you to forgive me. And I'm done with them. I'll live for you for the rest of my life. Lord, I'm done. You can't serve two masters. You're drinking and smoking. The body is the temple of God. You shouldn't be doing that. Amen. You're cussing and lying and doing all things. You shouldn't be doing that, my God. The Bible said the same mouth come blessing and cursing. These things ought not be, my God. I'm done with it. Gambling and doing all these ungodly, going to your boys, I'm smoking weed. No, no, I'm going to get saved. I'm done. That old girl bring you, God. I'm going to get saved. I'm leaving you alone. We can't be fornicating. We can't be playing. We can't be giving adultery. I'm done with that. Going to the club, my God. Ungodly club and all that. Lie. I'm done. I'm going to get Say, I'm done. You count the cost while you're standing there. When you're going up to the altar of prayer, you count the cost. I'm done. I'm done. Well, the same way okay. when a person goes and gets sanctified, Lord, I'm done. <laughs> Whatever you want to do with me, I'm done, God. Right. Lord, I'm consecrating everything I am. Burn me up, God. Burn me up every which way about me that's selfish. Lord, purge it out of me now. Lord, I don't care that God, my attitude, little thing. I may not go off on them, but something deep down inside me still want to go off on them, Lord. God, I always have that attitude down in me. If somebody come against me, I will stand my ground. I'm not going to stand my ground. I'm going to trust you to stand it for me. Lord, do what you want to do, God. It don't matter, dear God. Lord, take this attitude. I got take ambition. Lord, burn me up. I'm done. I don't want to see me no more. Father, 
crucify this old man. Crucify him, God. Lord, I want to live for you exclusively. I don't want to see me no more. I'm sick of me. I'm sick of it, Lord. I just want to see you. If you don't hurt me, they hurt me. It don't matter. I'm just going to pray. I'm not getting no more attitude. I'm not fighting no more. Lord, I want to be what you have me to be. I'm done, God. I'm done, God. Do what you want to do. Go over to Acts chapter 15, verse 9. To purify, to purify, to purify. So we seem to set apart for sacred use. To set apart. That's power in the church. Amen. It's power in the church. When we set apart our lives for God to do whatever He wants to do with us. And there's power in the church when we allow God to purify our very natures. Acts 15, 9, read yeah, verse 38. And God, which knoweth the hearts, uh -huh. bear them witness, uh -huh. giving them the Holy Ghost, All right. even as he did unto us. All right, so they were saved. Now he gave the Holy Ghost. And he gave them the witness of how he gave it to them. Read it. And put no difference between us and them, uh -huh. purifying their hearts by faith. Purifying their hearts by faith. Lord, I don't want no selfish. God is saying, I can't really use you. Like I want to use my God. There must be a purification. Some people say there's no purification and sanctification. We see clearly. Yeah. He said he purified their hearts by faith. Okay. So sanctification is the act of a person that has been saved going to an altar of prayer, asking God to sanctify them, to fill them with their spirit. They are consecrating their all to God. Laying themselves on an altar before God. Not an aspect of their life, but their whole lives. Yes. And God purifying their hearts. Urging that carnal nature. That old man. Completely conforming to the image of Christ. God having this way. The what of sanctification. Let's look at the why. Go over to Genesis chapter 1. Verse 26. Genesis chapter 1. Verse 26. Why is sanctification needed? Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Read. And God said, let us make man in our image. And God said, let us make man in our image. So you had the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost together there. And God said, let us make man in our image. Now go over to John chapter 4, verse 24. Write the scripture down. You're doing a lesson on sanctification. All right, the why. So mankind was originally created in the image of God. God said, let us make man in our image. So mankind originally created, Adam, Eve, originally created in the image of God. John 4, verse 26, read. Now, we, is he talking about uh, an African American? Is he talking about a European American? Is he talking about an Indian? Is he, let's make him higher. Right, let's make him six feet tall or four feet tall or, or is it eight feet tall? Let's make him look like uh, Justin Bieber or Shaq or or, Beyond, or or anybody else, Christopher Columbus or Martin Luther King. What, what, let us make man in our image. What, what, did he, what was he talking about there? What color is the first man going to be? Is that what this is discussing? Let's see what God is and what is the image of God. Come on. God is the spirit. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit. So God is not black, white, green, yellow, blue, African American, Brazilian, or anything, anything like that. Anything, he's not talking about that. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must, must worship him in spirit and in truth. So when he said, let us make man in our image, God is a spirit. So give us some understanding of the Spirit. Go over to Leviticus chapter 19, verse number 2. Write that down. So you got Genesis 126. God makes us in our image. John 4, 24. God is a Spirit. So he wasn't talking physical attributes. Leviticus 19, 2. Go on and read. Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel. The image of God. Come on. Ye shall be holy. Ye shall be holy. For I, the Lord your God, am holy. So God is a spirit. In Leviticus 19, 2, he clearly speaks about what the spirit is. He said, God is holy. Ye shall be holy. For I, the Lord your God, am holy. So God is a holy spirit. God created man holy. 
by the third chapter, the serpent said, eat from this tree. Disobey God. Eat from this tree. They ate from that tree. Go over to Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. Let's line this up. Genesis, the why of sanctification. Why is it needed? Why does the Bible talk about sanctification? Why is there types in the Old Testament about sanctification? In the tabernacle, there was the first one which represents justification. As soon as they got in there, first you had to make a sacrifice, then you were cleansed. There's a cleansing here, and the laver refers from sin, sins committed. Then we go into this, and we have a justified experience. Amen. But there's another room back here that represents the Holy of Holies. <laughs> Which represents sanctification. Why is it two distinct experiences? Why when he put them, pulled them out of Egypt, they went out of Egypt, they crossed the Red Sea, why didn't they just go straight to Canaan? But why did they go to the wilderness? What does that represent? What are all these things? What are all these things representing? So here we see that man was created in God's image. God is holy. Man ate from the tree. Genesis 3, 6, read. And when the women saw that the tree was good for food, uh -huh. and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and uh -huh. the tree to be desired to make one wise, yes. she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. Read. And gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. They're both guilty. Read. And the eyes of them both were opened. And the eyes of them good. Not talking about physically. They were already able to see before this. They seemed really good at 2020 vision. Oh, Why? Because God created them. But it said the eyes of both of them were open. There was a change that took place. Oh, they knew that they were naked. There was a change that took place. There was a difference in the came. That holiness was gone. There was an innocency that was innocency that was lost. They fell. And it affected them on the inside. Go over to chapter three, 5. Read verse number 3. Created holy in the image of God. Disobeyed God. They lost the innocency. They knew on the inside their eyes were open. They saw things differently. Their heart became defiled. Oh Read. And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. So here we have it, where he had another child. Or he had a child. And read that verse one more time. And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own life. So here was the first child that came. And he got a child in his own likeness. He wasn't just talking about he looked like me. But after he failed, at first it said he was created in God's image, but now he committed sin. He had a child. What was he saying here? Go over to Psalm 58, verse 3. David made it very clear what he was talking about here. The why of sanctification. Why do we have to, after we ask forgiveness, why do we need to go back to an altar of prayer to get sanctified, to get purged? Psalm 58, 3, read. The wicked are estranged from the womb. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they are born. They go astray as soon as they are born. Speaking lies. Speaking lies. Did you eat no cookie? Uh-uh. <laughs> Who taught you how to lie? You grew up in a Christian home where they actually had devotion in the daytime. They didn't teach you that. Where did you learn how to lie? You can take a little child. They ain't heard nothing but Christian music. Been in church all their life. Take them out to the mall somewhere, and they hear some little doom, 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 doom. Without well, nobody even teaching them or training them. That little child, doom, 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 doom. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Whoa, doom, doom, no, no! Jesus loves me this, yes! What in the world does that come to me? You heard that before? Who taught you how to do that? As a matter of fact, you, listen, you never have to teach them the fool they are. Let them, don't give them something they want. Where they at? Who taught you how to get an attitude? Yes. You ain't never seen, I mean, you ain't never seen the, where you get that? I hope they ain't seen mommy and daddy doing that. Right. Where's that coming from? Yeah. I don't know what, it said, what did he read in the game? He something that David said, what did he say? The wicked are estranged from the womb. The wicked are estranged, why? 
because our foreparents committed sin and when my God children are born now, that trait is straight handed down generation to generation. Here they were thousands of, gen of thousands of years later when David said, my God, the revelation of God, the wicked are estranged from the womb. From the womb, without even any, uh, 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 they say a lot of people scientifically and the mo uh, 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 socially and psychology, they say that these are learned traits and this, that, and the other because they don't believe in the Bible. They, they said no, ch children learn these things. They learn disobedience. They learn attitudes. They learn this. But the Bible says yeah, no, it's not. It, it, from the womb, That's the right. Bible says no. It's powerful about the Bible. Yeah. All you gotta do is all the facts will bang up you. Amen. All you gotta do is say, listen, this child ain't Take this child, put him in a very secure environment. Never show them anything and that child will steal steal a cookie. They never know about them stealing no cookie. See the facts in life will bang up scripture. Amen. So here he said from the womb Amen. because of that handing down from our foreparents. Go to Psalm 51. Go back seven verses, seven chapters. Psalm 51 5. The why. Behold, yes, I was shaken in iniquity, uh -huh. and in sin did my mother conceive. I was shaken in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Conceived, David says. I was conceived. Over in Ephesians, I'll go there 2, verse 3, we're going to write it down. It says that, who by nature were the children of wrath. By your nature. Nobody to teach you that. By nature, we were children of wrath. You have to be quickened, poor, dead, and trespassing in sin. Time pass one forty verse one. It's by who by nature the children of wrath. Why do we need to be sanctified? Because we fall two planes below. When we come to the age of accountability, we commit sin and we fall into sin openly. But when we're born, we're already born with the disposition to commit sin. When we get saved, God forgives us of the sins that we are responsible for. Forgiveness. We're not responsible for that nature. God forgives us for the sins that we committed that we knew. You can't be broken and contrite about something that you weren't responsible for. You're broken and you feel guilt and you feel contrition and you feel bad because of the things that you knew better that you did and you still did them. You're godly, sir. He said you got to bring forth fruit meant for repentance. See, that fruit is brokenness and contrition and godly sorrow for what you did. Not sorry you got caught, but sorry, my God, that you've sinned against God and you're broken and you're contrary and you're willing never to do them again and you confess it and God will forgive you. But you can't be broken and contrary about something that you weren't responsible for. Okay. So here, you're forgiven, but that nature needs to be pure, purged. The why of sanctification. Even after the apostles, go to Luke chapter 10, verse 20. Let's just touch this. The apostles were saved. Luke 10, verse 17. I actually had a brother call me one time who was espousing a one cleansing doctrine, and he said the apostles weren't saved until Pentecost. But we're going to follow the word of God and not man. Amen? amen. Thank the Lord. Amen. We're going to follow God's word tonight. So make sure you write this stuff down if you ever have to defend the truth. The things we're going to cover in the next few minutes is very deep in regards to defending the gospel. All right? Luke 10, verse 17. Read. And the 70 returned again with joy. Say, Come on. Lord, and, and the 70 devils. returned again with joy. So he sent out 70. Go back to chapter, I mean, verse number 1. 10, verse number 1. The, the why of sanctification, the apostles were saved. Read. After these things, uh -huh. the Lord appointed their seventy also, uh -huh. and sent them two by two and two before his face into every city and place, where he himself would come. What did he send them there for? Read verse 2. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly yeah. is great, but the labor is So he few. sent them out to labor for him. Amen. Why in the world would God send some unsaved folk out to labor for him? They need to be converted themselves. Now go to verse number. 17 read. And the 70 returned again with joy. Come on. Saying, Lord, yes. even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Devils can't cast out devils. Right. They're in partnership with each other. That's right. Good Light word, can't cast out Amen. darkness. Word, Light brother. can cast out Amen. darkness. Amen. Darkness Amen. cannot Amen. cast out darkness. Clear, brother. Amen. Keep reading, brother. 
And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. My Lord, the influence of the devil himself. These brothers went forth and he said, I beheld Satan fall from heaven. I beheld my God their influence being cast down because of the gospel. Keep reading. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you, notwithstanding in this rejoice not. He said, don't even rejoice in the fact that you got this power and you're you doing these great acts. Okay. He said, those are great. But let me tell you what you really need to rejoice for. If you really understand <laughs> eternity and life, and you really understand what you did when you became, and you accepted me, and you took up your cross, and became a follower of me. Really understand what took place when you invited me into your heart, and you repented from sin. Read, brother. But rather rejoice. Yes. Because your names are written in heaven. He said rejoice. Sinners' names are written in heaven. Unsaved folk names are written in heaven. You say, preacher, give me Bible on that. Go over to Revelation chapter 20, verse number 11. Let's line this up with the word of God. The apostles were saved before Pentecost. When they accepted Christ, my God, they turned from wickedness and they became a follower. They went out and labored for Christ. They cast out devils. They healed sick. They were laboring God's vineyard. And their names were written in heaven. My God. Revelation 20, verse number 11. What the word of God say? Read, brother. And I saw a great white throne. And I saw a great white throne. He's giving you a view into eternity. Read. And him that sat on it. Yes. From whose face the earth and heaven fled away. Yes. And there was found no place for them. There was found three, brother. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. My Lord. And the books were open. It don't matter, my God, how much money you got, Bill Gates, my God, or John Paul Getty, or any Rockefeller, my God. I saw the dead, both small and great. If you were broke, you didn't have no money, my God, or you had a lot of money, that money won't do you any good in the judgment. Amen. You will stand before God. That's, That's why right, the brother. Bible says, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world yes, or lose his soul? You will not be a big shot in the judgment. Oh. You ain't write, my God, your checks how you want to write them, your name and lights on billboards. You got uh, uh, endorsement deals and fancy cars and fancy clothes, women throwing themselves at you, my God, presidents and everybody else inviting you in, but all on that great day of judgment, my God. God, it won't matter what kind of car you drove, it won't matter, my God, what school you graduated from, it won't matter what your last name was, you gonna stand before God, the small and great, you gonna stand before him, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that he is Lord, but it's gonna be sad because some of them, some of them are gonna confess too late. My God. Come on, read, brother. And I saw the dead. Yes. All in grace. Yes. Before God. Yes. And the books were open. Yes. And another book was open. My mind. Which is the book of life. Oh, the word of God and in your life. Measuring up as a pastor brought out yesterday. Read. And the dead were judged out of those things My mind. written in the books. Yes. According to their work. The word of God according to the way you live. Read, brother. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. Yes. And the death and hell were delivered up the dead were, which were in them. Yes. And they were judged, every man according to their work. Read, brother. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Read, brother. And whosoever was not found written in the whosoever book. Whosoever was not found in the book of life was cast, was cast into, the lake, into of the lake of fire. Why? Because if their name were found in the book of life, he says, welcome to heaven, my child. Come to heaven which was prepared. Why? Because you were saved before Pentecost, the apostles had their name written. That's why when he came back, they were rejoicing. We did this. We did this. He said, don't rejoice over that. Rejoice because your name is written in heaven. And in Revelation, he said on the day of judgment, those whose names were not written were cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. But those whose names were written didn't go to the second death, which is the lake of fire, because he said, welcome to heaven, my child. Amen. Amen. So we see that the apostles were saved. But look what he said in verse 24 of Luke. Verse 46, 24, 46. They were saved in Luke 20. He said, their names are written in life. In, in heaven. He said, but I got a great work for you to do. I got a place that I need you to go labor. Why didn't he just send them? Why didn't he just say, go, go labor? Why did he say, Terry, read. And said unto them, Yes. 
Thus it is written, Yes, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Come on. And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye were witnesses of these things, mm -hmm. and I beheld, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power. So they were saying, high. and he was with them, and they were laboring. My God. When he said, there's a work you got to do, and I'm not going to be with you. Oh, God. He said, but tarry, don't go and do this work yet. Wait. Something got to take place. There's an experience that you don't have. If you don't get this experience, you're not going to be successful. If you don't get this experience, you're not going to be able to live out the gospel. Go over to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Let's see what he said. So Luke ended. The same writer of Luke was the writer of Acts. Watch what he said in verse number 8. This all ties together. Acts 1, verse 8. But ye shall receive power. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Now you got power to do the work of God. After which the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Come on. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Listen to what he's saying. Ye shall receive power. He says, after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses. Hold on, saints. Watch how this line up. Don't go nowhere yet. Terry, although you went and told them about me, but I don't need you just to tell folk about me now. I need you to show folk. I need you to witness everything in the book. You need more power than you got right now. Because although you can say Christ is over here, there are some aspects that you can't witness. Folk who don't go on to get truly sanctified, there will be elements of their life that they can't fully witness the message of Christ. If somebody do them wrong for real, they can't be a fool. Look at their heart. God shows them on the screen. Look at their heart. Look what they did. They overlook it. Now they're talking about 80% of what they're saying is not true. They've been nothing but nice to those people. Watch their heart. Don't even look at their actions. Watch their heart. Now begin to watch their actions. Watch how they treat them. Watch what they say about them to their friends. Watch how they respond to them after they are aware of how they treated them. Watch that young person. They're saying, God is using them. Watch their heart. I'm going to give you scripture for every one of these. Watch their heart when God began to use that other young person. And how when they sung, and everybody was so excited when they saw him. Oh, so annoying. Ooh, you just do something. Ooh. But God saved somebody else. And God began to use them. Look at their heart when they get up. Watch their heart when the same crowd that used to say that she walked on water is now saying that she walking on waves. Look at their heart when hands are going up in the building. Look at their heart when that director overlooks her now and says, come here, I want you to sing this part. I just, look at their, who can handle, what human being can handle this stuff? What human being can handle, Jesus saw their hearts, the why of sanctification. They had to live off the Bible going out without Christ when these things was happening. When they were dogged, I'm going to show you the scripture. When people were attacking them. And their heart had to be so pure that they lived out what Jesus said in his word. He knew that they weren't ready for this. Why? Go back to 9 verse 46 in Luke. The same writer. The, the why of sanctification. We must see this unless we won't actually pursue it. And we must see ourselves in our humility and say, Lord, is this me? Luke 9, verse 46. One of the great things that's lacking in the church today. Sanctification. Fully. Luke 9, verse 46. Line it up. Then there arose a reasoning among them. Yeah. Which of them should be great? What? 
It said, which one of them should be the greatest? Which one of them will be the one? I'm, I'm the one. I, I'm the one. Which one of them? Uh, 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 I want to be the singer. I want to be. Jealousy. Envy. Can't even labor together. God is limited on how much glory he can even pour out among you because you, it would destroy y'all. So why, if an individual doesn't go on to get sanctified, they're going to find envy in between them, trying to outdo each other, trying, instead of having each other support, encouraging one another, strengthening one another, go over to verse 54. And when his disciples... James and John saw this. They said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? So they didn't receive them. If you read a couple verses before, they didn't receive them. You're going to not be received in your life. Right. They didn't receive them. So they said, you know what? Right now, talk about me. Hold on. You, you saying this against me? Okay. God, right now, we got some power. Let's call down some fire right now. Burn them up. But right now. Y'all want okay, to do this? Oh, go ahead. No. We're well, earn to the other cheek. Read the sermon on the mount. Pray for them to despitefully use you. Do you know how many times in the church somebody going to do something that you don't agree with, Amen. overlook you, say something about you they shouldn't say, and if you got this spirit still down inside you, you're going to be trying to call down fire or you're going to use your tongue to be fire against them, and that's not being a witness of them, of the gospel. That's why he said you got to go on to be sanctified. You have a bunch of people that so joy and talk about the gospel, but very few people are living there. All right. Oh my God. Good. All right. If you don't go on, you're going to be calling fire. You're going to possess a talkback spirit. He's really with that. Go to John, chapter number 21, verse number 15. Let's light this up with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The why? We can't have people talking back with mouth. John 21, verse 15. So when they had died, Jesus said to Simon Peter, uh -huh. Simon, Son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Be my lamb. Read. He said to him again. This is an second. example of somebody getting on your nerves and the, how a carnal person will respond. Read. He said to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, feed my sheep. I know how that is when somebody just keeps saying the same thing over and over. Yeah, <laughs> you, you just told me this. Simon, Samantha, Barjona, wash the dishes. Yay, mom, I will. Samantha, Barjona, wash the dishes. Yay, mom, I will. Samantha, Barjona, wash the dishes. Read. He says unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, love is not me. Peter was green because he said unto him the, the third time. Oh, I'm oh, 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 oh. Lee, Lee, Lee. Say anybody how you say it. Leave me alone. It's about the inside. My God, now. That's good. It's provoking. It's going to be people that get on your nerves. Yeah. <laughs> you want some bosses that get on your nerves. You want some coworkers that get on your nerves. You want some teachers that get on your nerves. You want some parents that get on your nerves. You want some children that get on your nerves. And if you don't go on to get a definite purging of the Holy Ghost and all of you, let's read what he said, brother. Read. Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love Lord, you know everything else? <laughs> you are missing, I'm in present, I'm in this, 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 this. So why won't you look into my heart and tell me what I'm thinking, what I'm about to say? <laughs> you know everything else? <laughs> so, Mama, you ain't never wrong. <laughs> Honey, you ain't never wrong. So why is it? Well, I haven't even gonna say nothing. You ain't never wrong anyway. You always got the right answer anyway. Oh my God. <laughs> why? Why? In the gospel, he 
He said every word you're going to be, every idol you're living. Right. It talks about sharing, uh, turn to the other cheek. He preached all of this. He said, man, y'all ain't ready for this. Right. I know y'all like it. It's sweet to your mouth. But it's going to be bitter in your stomach. Oh, yeah. He said, y'all not ready to be a witness of me. I'm not talking. Before you were witnessing, telling about me. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's going to another level now. Yeah. It's going to another level now. Now, I need you to go and live. See, I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> it's easier to sing about some stuff than live. Yes, right. It's easier to preach about some stuff than live. It. Okay. It's easier to encourage somebody else about something than you do it. Right. He said, I ain't, here. I, I ain't trying to hear no more. Right, brother. It's deeper than that now. You can either sung it, preach about it, talk about it, win wisdom, all this other stuff. Now I need to, to go and live it. Y'all not ready? The why? They have been forgiven. Names written. But there was a carnality there. An old man there. That was hindering them from being a full witness of the entirety in their homes when children cutting up. Mom and dad. Children, young people, when mom and dad overbearing. When they overlooked in church. When people used to celebrate them, now that's transferred to somebody else. Living out the gospel. The what and the why. We have to wait to get to the how. Let's go. Wow. Thank Father, we thank you for your goodness and faithfulness.